Hello, everyone. My name is Shane German, the music director at WYCE 88.1 FM in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Today, we're thrilled to welcome into our virtual studio, Lael Neal. Following the release of her 2015 critically acclaimed debut album, I'll Be Your Man, Virginia-raised singer-songwriter Lael Neal struggled with figuring out where to take her sound next, completing a few full albums, only to shelve them. But in 2019, while living in L.A., she began experimenting with four-track cassette home recording and stripped-down songwriting on a Suzuki Omnichord, a synth-like instrument with a unique but limited set of sonic possibilities. These experiments slowly became the songs that would make up her newly released sophomore album and her sub-pop debut, Acquainted with Night. The beautiful 10-song set, while minimalist in presentation, merges lo-fi electronic folk with lyrical images of nature, reflected of the sounds and clouds, rivers, fields, and woods of her 600-acre cattle farm upbringing. Please welcome to WYCE, Lael Neal. Shooting me. 
Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. It is a f absolutely stunning record. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I want to talk to you uh, after your initial 2015 debut. Uh, you know, you did Bonnaroo and you were living in L.A. and you tried to do a couple of full albums to kind of follow that up, but they weren't working. Talk to me about what wasn't working uh, with those uh, kind of follow up releases and how your songwriting kind of changed once the Omnichord kind of came into your life. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's kind of a long time, six years between, between albums. And, um, and mostly it was because I, I kept going to different musicians and producers thinking that I needed just the perfect person who would magically kind of, uh, create this whole other alternate realm that my songs could live in and that I needed kind of more to, to bolster the songs and that it kind of just, um, I just kept hearing music that I wanted my music to sound like and was kind of pursuing these different, these different people and sounds. And every time kind of midway through the recording process, I would, I would kind of start feeling this kind of deadening, like sinking feeling of um, of the songs getting a little bit watered down. That was kind of the best word I had for it, um, or or made heavier, and and the words and the voice weren't kind of like ringing through in the way that I I hoped that they would, and so I kind of just got so frustrated that I eventually started talking to a friend of mine, Guy Blakesley. And he was like, you know, I think you just need to, I think you just need to have the tools yourself and I'll set it all up for you. And we're going to use my four track because I think that's simple enough for you to understand because mm -hmm. <laughs> he knew I was very technically inept. And, um, and then we kind of started talking about the idea of, of the sound of lost tapes or the sound of kind of the music that, I love that you discover that seems like it's been buried for a long time and it, but it feels very relevant to now. And so that kind of was all stirring around as I was starting to record some music on the four track. And then earlier I, I had found a sound that I was really interested in coming from a music a instrument called the Nova chord and in pursuing what that was, a friend of mine said, well, there's only like 200 in existence now because they were made in the 1940s. But here, try this Omnichord that I have. And I was totally disinterested in it because it was like you described it in the beginning, a kind of plastic looking synthesizer machine. And I just thought it was like a children's toy kind of. Mm -hmm. But bringing that home... I completely fell in love with the sound that it made and the space and texture that it created beneath my voice. And so that kind of happened right in conjunction with, with the four track cassette recorder. And I, I just kind of did it all in a pretty short span of time. And uh, with, with Guy Blakesley's kind of guidance and engineering, but I was able to kind of do it myself. So it, this is the long winded answer to your no, question. <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, <laughs> and, and so that, that's kind of when the light went off for me that I had needed to kind of come to my own power with creating this record instead of kind of trying to, to have someone save me really was what I'd been looking for. And so, so yeah, that, that's kind of how, how this record came, came to be. And that's why it's kind of so sparse and stark in some ways. It's really stunning. Uh, Omnicord, I looked up kind of the history of it. It was kind of introduced in the 1981 um, from the Suzuki Musical Instrument Corporation. Um, but a lot of people have played it. I, my kindergarten uh, teacher uh, back in the 80s played it and we yeah. sang songs with it. I re distinctly remember my kindergarten teacher having one in our class. Wow, yeah. Um, and it's kind of like it has a harp-like 
sound to it. Uh, but the, the very notable people have played it. Cindy Lauper plays one, and oh, uh, cool. Brian, Brian Eno, David Bowie has played one. Uh. Daniel Daniel Lanois. So when your CD came in, uh, you know, I put it in. And I I was it was I was it was a sound that kind of drew me back to my kindergarten teacher in a weird way, yeah. but it's not, it's not retro. You're not, it's not eighties retro at all because the way, yeah. the way that you merge your songwriting, um, and the lyrical imagery of what you're doing, um, with kind of like the lo-fi sound, it's almost orchestral the way that, it, that you're doing it. It's absolutely stunning. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Um, that's that's kind of how I felt when I heard it was that it was this um, orchestra in a box that I could could kind of control and and conduct a little bit, but um, but it's pretty limited. And I th I think that's other, the other gift of it is that it because it is kind of a children's toy. That's that's kind of how, what's been in my mind. So it's cool to hear that you actually had that experience mm -hmm. as a kindergartner, because I think finding the Omnichord was like becoming a child again with music and it really kind of opens the space to just play and instead of instead of thinking it of songs as chord changes which i had with guitar and piano the omni chord is laid out in a way that uh i'm making shapes with the chords so i'm not even really thinking about the chords but i'm 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 just making shapes with my hand. So it was very childlike, the whole process of making it. And I think that kind of makes it pure in a way. Um, there wasn't a lot of intellectual thinking behind it, really. Um, yeah. It's really, really just a very unique sound. And it's not something that I have heard in a long time. Um, and the way that you uh, present these gorgeous 10 songs on Acquainted with Night. It's just really uh, a very pleasurable, intimate listening experience that kind of takes you out of time almost. Um, it's just quite stunning. Um, now you grew up uh, on a 600 acre cattle farm in Virginia. Uh, how did that, how does that um, kind of upbringing and being in such a massive um, natural space, how does that affect your songwriting? Yeah, I think I think it kind of it brought. I mean, I, I, it's funny because I'm back here now, so I'm definitely thinking about that a lot about how this contributed to to the music that I make. And it's funny because I I actually think that. Um, Los Angeles had a really huge impact on the way that this album was made, Acquainted with Night, um, because I think we're kind of always trying to find balance in our lives. And the city was so loud and overstimulating. And it was so opposite from my experience growing up in solitude and isolation, basically, and so much quiet. I mean, my parents chose the farm because it was as quiet as you could possibly find a place in Virginia. So, um, so in Los Angeles, I was trying to create a space that was quiet, um, with the album, um, as kind of like to counter the, the noise and stimulation of the city. And, um, and so being back here, I see, it's like, I want to make more noise and be louder <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and make, like rock music out here. So I think that was kind of the compulsion when I was out here as a child, I wanted to sing and I was always like running around in the fields and, and making noise and, um, and just listening to birds, listening to nature. And, and also in terms of writing, I think having space and quiet is essential for me. Um, so, so that all contributed to, to kind of my love of, of words and books and escaping into imagination. And, um, and so that, that's kind of how things kind of came together for, for my music. Now your brother is also a musician that kind of specializes in flamenco and Brazilian yeah. 
Brazilian stuff. Were you a musical household or um, well, growing up? You know, my parents were really into music. They love they were music lovers. Um, and my mom has an incredible voice, but she's too has too much stage fright or fear to kind of push through that past that. So I'm trying to kind of like urge her on with that. Um, and my dad started playing the bass when he was 45. And so now he plays music a lot too. So it's kind of more that we're, we love music. And I grew up in a household of, um, we were always going to music festivals and shows and they were taking us out way underage went to bars and clubs to hear music. So that's kind of where I, where I'm coming from with my family, but, um, but not, you know, we weren't, um, wasn't like I was five years old and made to sit at the piano and, and learn piano. It was kind of, it was pretty open. Uh, you're also, uh, a, a, a- I've looked at your some of your paintings. You're also a painter, uh, and you do these gorgeous watercolor um, paintings. Um, how does visual arts? And you're also doing some really cool, like Sony Handycam video <laughs> video work too. How how does um, the visual art medium kind of play into your artistic expression? I think it's it's kind of essential. I feel like it, it's when the well runs dry on music or I feel just annoyed with it or sick of it or whatever, then I can go to painting or, or a visual art. Um, and that that's kind of fresh and new again. And then when I go back to music, that's fresh and new again. So it's kind of always about, um, finding a flow between them. And, and I think that the, the painting really, um, that's kind of the most in a meditative state that I am. I really kind of lose track of time. And I'm not really like that with music, which a lot of people say that that's kind of their experience in, in making music. I don't, I don't really improvise or get lost in the flow of making music as much. I'm much more like I'm going to sit down and write a song and this is the way it's going to go. And I'm kind of like, uh, I'm much looser and freer in painting because I don't care about it as much. <laughs> and that's, that seems strange to say, but I guess it's just, it's kind of like something I also do, but music is like the, the thing that's really, really important to me. So I kind of put maybe too much pressure on that. Well, I think what you're doing uh, with the music and then the the uh, video, uh, you know, the handicam videos that you're doing out there on the farm um, is a really nice juxtaposition of, you know, kind of getting away from technology, but also kind of incorporating uh, incorporating it in a fresh way. It's really, really interesting the way that you're that you're incorporating uh, both the visual medium and um, the musical medium as well. Um, now, Guy Blakesley, your uh, musical partner, um, I do want to. I read this because uh, he's also got a, a new album out called "Postcards from the Edge." But I was researching his work as well. Um, uh, he was actually hit by a car. Is he okay? Is he doing yeah. okay? Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, that was kind of, um, that was a big thing that happened. In, it was March, Friday the 13th, March, Friday the 13th of 2020. So it was kind of right at the peak of the pandemic happening. Um, and he, yeah, he was walking across the street and got hit by a car and was in the neurological ICU for a few days and it was pretty, it was pretty scary. Um, and, and so that, that kind of like, that kind of spurred on a move away from the city. And, um, both of us had lost our jobs, uh, at the, that same weekend too, because of the pandemic. So, um, so yeah, it was kind of like a, a interesting chain of events that happened that, that triggered us moving here to Virginia to the farm. Um, but, but yes, he's he's doing much better. It, it took a long time for his eyes. He had an epidural hematoma, which which was um, 
bleeding on the brain. So it had messed with the, some nerves in his eyes. So he had extreme double vision for for many, many months. So being on the farm was a was kind of a really good recuperation place to be where there's not anything around us. And um, so, yeah. Well, it was uh, really lovely talking to you. The brand new album is called Acquainted with Night. It's currently out on your Sub Pop debut, the legendary uh, record label Sub Pop Records. Uh, it's available on all streaming platforms at a record store near you. Uh, Lael, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Shane. Thank you.